This is Ask the Experts About Goth Gardening, a little bit of a different format than what most of our webinars are, but I think this is going to be very inspirational. So with that, let me introduce our three panelists who are here today and very excited to talk to you about their ideas for goth gardening. Uh, we have Jessica from American Taki, we have Stephanie from Doom and Orange, and we have Laura from Walters Gardens. Excellent. We can't wait to see the plants, but first, I thought I would explain a little bit. I, I think I've got numerous questions like, well, where did this idea for goth gardening come from? And Gail, who does all of our social media and marketing, um, is always out there and entering hashtags and seeing what's trending and everything. And so the hashtag goth garden has over 15,000 posts and that's goth garden. And then the hashtag goth gardening has 12,000 posts. So looking at that, we thought, okay, somebody is onto something. And so maybe we'll write a blog. So we did a blog on goth gardening last year and it was really popular. Um, the panelists that are on now, a lot of the plants um, are from their companies that were in that blog post. So then we thought, okay, the blog was a good start. So now let's take it to a webinar that we can share. And um, so what I wanted to start with is how about if we just kind of do a description or definition of goth gardening and let each one of our panelists describe kind of what their impression is of a goth garden. So who wants to go first? Laura, you're on screen. I'm going to I'm going to let you go first. OK, um, well, to be honest with you, I didn't really know that goth gardening was a thing until I saw um, the blog post that that NGB put up. Um, but I thought it was a pretty cool idea. Um, I've actually always been into like uh, horror books and horror movies. I'm a big Stephen King fan, so I think it's a really fabulous idea. And yeah, there are lots of neat black and dark colored plants that fill, fit into this theme very well. And I think um, part of what makes a goth garden to me is just a feeling that it gives you of kind of, um, you know, a dark or mysterious or kind of eerie feeling when you're in the garden. Mysterious. I like that. And okay. And I am so sorry. I didn't invite Stephen King to be on this webinar. Shame on me. Oh, I too bad. I wish I would have <laughs> thought of that. Okay. Um, okay, so Stephanie, let's go to you and let's let's get your description or definition of goth gardening. Sure. So similarly to Laura, um, I had never really heard of the trend, um, but did a lot of research in it. And uh, as I was researching, I realized that um, in some past experiences, I've actually uh, like in partaken in goth gardening, but also uh, helped some customers out in my previous life as a uh, independent garden retailer. Uh, we actually had a customer who would only buy black foliage or black blooming plants. Um, and she would always come in every spring asking us for what we had new that was dark colored or black colored. Um, and also had this affinity to asking us about what sort of antique um, pieces, whether it be statuary or arbors or uh, settees, furniture, things for her garden that she could make into um, uh, her own modern day, uh, like secret garden. Or I like to think sometimes of something out of like Beauty and the Beast or like the Victorian era. So less Marilyn Manson and maybe more uh, Belle and Beauty and the Beast uh, kind of idea. And um, I realized that, oh, this customer is actually participating in goth gardening. And uh, having actually seen her garden before, it is quite lovely. It is, um, there's a, a little nook and cranny to discover at each different corner. Um, and the way that she's kind of incorporated all kinds of different little pieces and, and knickknacks to find is really unique and different. So we'll talk more about that uh, in today's discussion. Oh, that's good. And yeah, and I love that, the nook and crannies to discover mm -hmm. because, you know, Hopefully you're not scared when you go around a corner and see something, but isn't that the <laughs> fun you. of a garden having different rooms and everything? So, okay, awesome, awesome. Love the definition. Um, and Jessica, what about you? Your description or definition of goth gardening? Yeah, so I learned goth gardening as a combination and using um, colors of black, white, and red. And so because Taki's seed breeding has 
you know, areas that fit those colors, we actually started playing around with those combinations this year and they're quite striking. So whether you're into the the quote unquote theme of goth gardening, or you're just looking for something that's like striking and works, goth gardening does. And so we've had, yeah, fun playing around with white, red, and black combinations. Um, <clears throat> yeah, moody, uh, I also love vignettes, like little corners in, in gardens um, where it feels more intimate and small, even if it's a large scale um, thought process. So I'm a huge fan of of that thoughtful, like, you know, small, intimate corner or vignette um, that you can do these color schemes with. And it it kind of makes sense because we had a, um, a heyday with moon gardening and that's when you plant like all white. And so it's natural that we would have these other themes. Um, like goth gardening. Yeah, and I was just thinking about, um, I don't know, two or three years ago, even before we were thinking about this goth garden, it, it felt to me that we were seeing a lot more plants coming through with dark foliage, dark flowers, that kind of thing. And I mean, I know all three of you are young ladies, but um, based on what you've seen over the years, would you say that darker foliage is definitely more popular now than it was five or 10 years ago? Without a doubt. Um, I actually was going back through some like personal like industry notes and uh, it was about 10 years ago that um, uh, Martha Stewart actually on her TV show had a special on dark foliage and black plants. So if Martha was maybe even setting the, the trend back then, um, it's just interesting to see how it's has grown and evolved and maybe not always been called goth gardening this entire time, but um, you know, similarly to Jessica, it, I think it keeps, you know, growing and connecting with other, you know, themes like moon, moon gardening and things like that. So definitely gaining traction from what we've seen. So since I'm on the breeder end of it, so I work for a breeding company and we're the ones who are like, um, you know, cross pollinating and finding new interesting introductions for the industry. Um, we look at it from a standpoint of like, well, dark foliage adds attraction, whether there's a fruit or a flower on the plant. And so it's nice at retail when we have our, our customers at the store, when they see something that they can appreciate um, with striking characteristics, whether it has a fruit and flower. And then of course, when it fruits and flowers, it adds just that much more interest to it. So yeah, bronze and black foliages are striking just in their foliage alone. So, um, yeah, you had said something that maybe you weren't thinking about it quite as goth gardening. Um, are there any other terminologies that you three have heard of that might be like, oh, this is the same concept. It's just not called gar goth gardening. I mean, Jessica, you talked about moon gardens. Um, are, are there other terminologies that maybe you've seen or heard or created or used um, that is kind of a similar concept? Anyone? <laughs> I think, I mean, you hear about Victorian style gardens. And I know Stephanie mentioned that term Victorian and, and I have seen and heard of Victorian gardens before. And I think that's probably the closest um, in terms of like a themed garden or, or a, another way of talking about a goth garden. Cause a lot of the Victorian era themes, whether they're in gardening or in clothing or in uh, home decoration interiors, um, tended to have kind of that dark and mysterious feeling. So I think that's one that would be a similar theme. We've yeah, never and I heard see. of this out in, you know, the gardening world, but as we were preparing for this webinar, we brought up the idea of steampunk uh, that tends to have that, um, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of like gadgets and, and wheels and whatnot, but it's also dark and a bit moody and, and thoughtful, um, which I think ties with a lot of the plants we'll see today. Yeah, moody. I remember us talking about that the other day is it kind of sets a mood um, in in the garden. And I noticed that somebody else said a Halloween themed garden. And I think that was one of the things that uh, the four of us had talked about when we were prepping for today is, I mean, a quick, if you don't want to do a golf garden year round, you know, there might be some great ideas. And I think you guys have some plants um, that would be good for this. Uh, but doing like a quick goth theme just during the month of October in preparation for Halloween. So that's, that's part of it too. So I think we're ready to start talking about some plants. So we've put together this presentation and 
These are some new varieties. These are some classic varieties, but they all fit into our goth theme. And um, so we put them in order of trees and shrubs, down to perennials, down to annuals, and then we actually included a few edibles too. Um, so I'm not sure who is first, but we'll just kind of go through this. I thought this would set the theme, especially since it's got some hard goods in here. This actually was an article from HGTV. So they were right on, um, they called it hauntingly beautiful ideas for your Gothic garden, great title. And this shows like a little fairy garden versus a wreath versus some hardscaped in one of those little cubby holes or crevices that we were talking about. So this too kind of sits, sets the mood here. So from there, um, we thought we would start with trees and shrubs. And we do have this one that was in our uh, blog post. And I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this. It's called a walking stick. I think the, the structure of the limbs and the branches really lends itself. Does anybody else have experience? Have they grown this in their garden? We used to get special requests for this that when I used to work in retail um, for this this uh, tree in particular, uh, just because of its uniqueness and uh, just the you know funky nature of of its habit and form, and it definitely gives off that that spooky haunted house you know sort of look to it. So I, I would say this is the ultimate goth gardening uh, tree for sure. Yes, great, great. Okay, um, Laura, is this yours? Uh, this is not actually mine. Um, so um, we we only deal with the perennials at Walters, but um, one of our partners for Proven Winners, Spring Meadow Nursery, does a lot with shrubs, um, and they do have the dark foliage nine barks. Um, so I don't honestly know a ton about the nine bark plant myself, but I would just say that this goes in very well with that dark foliage theme. Right. And I believe this one is on our website. We can include a link when we send out everything after the fact. So we'll include a link not only to this presentation, but also to some of the new varieties that are in here that are also on our website. Thank you. This one is excellent. Also, if you have interest in growing um, for cut flower use, I do have a lot of my cut flower uh, growers that will do nine bark <clears throat> because it um, not only because the foliage adds excellence to bouquets and something striking, but then it does have a nice flower as well. And then, of course, just the stems um, can come off nice and long to fit bouquet work. So great for cut flowers, great for moody landscapes as well. Yes, and somebody said it's also a native plant, so you get the uh, native aspect there. And then we've got the smoke bush, and so not only with the dark foliage, but also that name, that smoky, you know, I'm kind of thinking of like dry ice giving out that smoky effect. Uh, so this one, smoke bush winecraft black would be another good shrub for a goth garden. And then we we've got... Yeah, Sorry. we use the smoke bush a lot in the south because it is very tough against heat and humidity. And then it, it actually does look like plumes of, of smokiness above it once it is in flower. So this one is excellent for, for a tough uh, landscape. Excellent. Now, this one is um, a Walters Gardens introduction. Um, we classify it as a perennial, but it definitely has this shrub-like appearance and can be used as a shrub. Um, the main difference being that it's going to die all the way down to the ground every year, but then return. So this is a hardy hibiscus. They're hardy all the way up into zone four. So even folks who live fairly far north can have these beautiful plants in their garden that have this giant, large, tropical looking flower. Of course, on this particular one, Holy Grail, it does give off kind of a darker moody vibe than some of the more brightly colored ones. Um, so Holy Grail was... One of the first introductions in our Summerific Hibiscus line to have the deep, dark black foliage. Um, we have since come out with some more that are even darker foliage, but they don't have that nice, dark, deep flower color that goes with the goth theme so well as this one. Um, and I think what makes our hibiscus breeding unique is that um, we've worked really hard to create some plants that have a nice habit with flowers from bottom to top. Um, if you look at some of the older hardy hibiscus genetics that have been around for a long time, um, they just don't have that fullness and dense habit 
um, and they tend to be a little bit taller and rangy. So these are ones that fit better into your typical gardener's uh, yard or space that they have available. Yeah, that's a beauty. I love the contrast there with the, the red and the dark foliage. That's yeah, and then you get, you can see in this picture very well when the flowers drop off, um, you get that bright kind of limey green calyx that remains on the plant. So you get that in addition. Um, and another thing about these hibiscus is that the, the newer breeding genetics um, also flower for much longer than some of the older ones. So it's just nicer for a longer period of interest in the, in the garden. And I'm looking at the size here. Is that maybe about five feet tall and wide? Yep. So this one is five feet tall and wide. Um, and then we have some other introductions that are um, a little bit smaller even. We've started breeding towards more compact even than that. So three and a half or so feet tall and wide. Um, I didn't put a photo in here because it's... Um, it's not an introduction yet, but we are working towards introducing one that will have that really nice deep dark black foliage with a pure white flower. Um, so that'll be something to come out in the future and that one will be in that even more compact habit range, so. Excellent, okay. Um, crepe, myrtle crepe myrtle shadow magic. So I was just comparing the pictures. Um, so we've got this, the hardy hibiscus with those deep red flowers and the dark foliage. And then you've got this one. So of course, good for the South. Jessica, I don't know if you wanna comment at all on crepe myrtle. Well, yeah, we use a lot of Lagerstromia crepe myrtle here in Georgia and because um, it tolerates um, our environment quite well. And then what's nice about the new introductions that uh, the traditional ones get quite tall, you have to do something called crepe murder to them to keep them uh, of, of a lower height, you know, that just refers to like chopping their heads off every year, which is why we call it murder. So maybe this is on topic. Um, but yeah, so some of the newer ones are great because they do always exhibit these bright, vibrant um, flowers. And then um, as these new introductions come along, the tidier habits and, and more uh, compact for different landscape sizes. Great. Okay. I'm going to flip to this screen. Um, and I realize it's not a perennial, my flower, but I just love the flower. But before we go on to some of the perennials, there is a question here. If you use black flowers or black foliage, do you have a suggestion on ratio with other colored flowers? That that to me is a tough question. I'm not sure if you guys um, have some comments. I mean, it's probably gonna be our usual answer of, well, it depends, right? Um, so it probably depends on the size and exactly what you're trying to achieve. And do you wanna mix red? Do you wanna mix white? Do you want only black? So I, I don't know, I'll let the experts make some commentary on that. Well, just as we heard earlier, you've got some some users of plants who want all black, and there's certainly nothing wrong with um, tailoring your tastes to the plants that you buy. So I would encourage that if that's the way you want to go. And without trying to be a frustrating answer, it really does depend. A lot of the work I do is with combo pots. And so um, I've done up to two thirds with like bronze and black um, foliage items with uh white flowers and green foliage for the the other one third of the of the combo pot um, that's following your whole thriller spiller and filler uh recipe so for combo pots um i think that yeah anything goes but uh just kind of look at the ratio and see if it's aesthetic to your eye is is what i would recommend I would I would second all of those comments, Jessica, um, having worked and done a number of combinations for doom and orange as well, too. Uh, and we like to actually use silver, too, as one of our uh, color components. You can find a lot of um, filler elements or those foliage pieces that are just kind of give the body to a combination um, that have either like silver foliage or um, a, a, a iridescent white, you know, kind of tone to it. Um, so I think that's the kind of the fun nature about plants is that you can kind of mix and match and, and play to your heart's content. Uh, they're kind of like the crayons in my crayon box uh, when I'm kind of making combinations. So if it looks good to you, then it's going to be good in your garden, I think is what we always like to say. Yeah, I'd like to add just one thing in landscaping, because a lot of the plants that uh, we bring to the market are absolutely suitable to use in containers, but probably more commonly used in landscaping. 
Um, and I will say that, um, again, if it's what you like to do, by all means do it, but I would try to not not trend towards using all dark foliage because then it's not going to stand out as well. So if you want to have some dark foliage, whether it's the black or the purple or the red, and also some black dark foliage or flowered plants, I would mix it up so that you don't have all dark foliage uh, because then they're just not going to pop. If you have some green foliage items with the darker flowers and then have um, a smaller number of the dark foliage plants tucked into various places, that's going to stand out a lot more than trying to use all dark plants. I love it. Great answers, everybody. Good advice. So, okay, let's go to uh, Laura. Is this yours? Yep, this is mine. Um, so this is um, a series, uh, one plant from a series of Baptisia that is part of the Proven Winners line. Um, this particular one is called dark chocolate because it does have these nice dark kind of purpley brown colored chocolatey flowers. So Baptisia is actually a native perennial to the United States. Um, and our breeding team has worked for many, many years to create plants that have a wide range of colors. So the native Baptisias are shades of blue and white primarily. Um, but now we have shades of all different colors available, including this nice dark chocolate color that goes very, very well with the goth theme. Um, and th this is another type of perennial that we have worked on kind of breeding the habit down. So if you take the native uh, versions of Baptisia, like Baptisia australis, they're very, very large plants, um, tend to be about six feet tall and wide. And the Baptisia that we have put into the program um, are more kind of the footprint of a peony. So they're going to be taking up more like a three foot or so space in your garden. Some are taller, some are shorter. Um, the other thing about these is that the flowers are much more elongated and sit up on top of the foliage much more nicely than the native types do. Um, so it's just more of a pronounced flowering display. Um, and then this is also a plant that as the season progresses and the flowers drop off, so this is something that blooms um, kind of in mid to late spring. After that, you have just a beautiful shrub looking plant. The foliage tends to be a little bit on the blue green side, so it's a little bit different shade than kind of a grass green. And then as you get on towards autumn, it actually makes these dark seed heads um, that if the if you were to take one off or take a branch off and shake it, you can actually hear them rattling. Um, but that nice dark uh, seed pod on the plant kind of gives you that dark look again later in the season. When you said rattle, I was thinking of kind of a horror film and do, 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 do. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It could lend that, um, you know, phonic effect, effect of goth too. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And I think there's picture... fully, fully artists out there. This one is the plant for you to use with your sound effects. Yes. There you go. Yep. And this demonstrates what you were saying, Laura, about the contrast, because look at those dark flowers on that bright green foliage. So that yes. right there demonstrates that contrast, which is which is great. OK, so let's go to Hugara. Yeah, so um, Hugara, um, we've got kind of three different examples here of different foliage textures that are all within that dark um, kind of color scheme. Um, so the one that is kind of in the silhouetted pot or the pot with the white background um, is a plant called Evening Gown. Um, this is actually the newest one of the three pictured here. So we introduced this one um, just last year and it's in a, um, a series of heucra that all have very ruffly foliage. So these are gonna be nice large plants with large foliage for the landscape, uh, but they all have very kind of roughly crinkled texture uh, leaves to them and really nice vigor. Um, the one that's on the top in the kind of beige and, and cream container um, is one called Black Pearl that's been out for a little bit longer. We've had that one out on the market for a number of years now. Um, and that one has more of a flatter, but scalloped textured effect to the foliage. Um, not quite as dark as evening gown, uh, but still very nice, um, rich coloration. Um, those two are both in the Proven Winners program. And then the one on the bottom there um, is a variety called Timeless Night that has um, foliage that's kind of intermediate between the two in terms of texture. Uh, the foliage tends to be a little bit smaller 
Uh, but then it does have these flowers. So the whole Timeless series has been selected to have these beautiful flowers that really last all season on the heuchera. It just continues to bloom. Um, all of these, whichever one that you prefer in terms of the texture or the look of it, um, are great shade plants. So they can be used in shady nooks and crannies of the garden. Um, they can also be great container aspects. So the heuchera is just something that works super well in terms of a perennial and a container. Um, and then if you're in more northern climates, you can actually use these in full sun. Um, so some of the heuchera that are lighter tones of, um, of foliage do you want to be in some shade. Um, even in the north, they would prefer afternoon shade, but these really dark ones can take pretty much as much sun as you can give them or shade. Awesome. Thank you. Love those heuchras. Okay, so I drew the black scallop. This is one of, of our perennials from Doom and Orange. And I love it because it is a great, um, it, it, you can use it as a perennial, but I also like using it in some of our uh, annual combinations as well, too. It's a really nice low growing uh, perennial, sometimes used in um, like the border of, of garden spaces. Um, I've had uh, gardening friends actually put it in their health strip or that portion in between, say, the road and uh, the sidewalk of our front yards, because uh, it can take a beating. It can take salt. It can take a lack of water. It can take full sun. It can take shade. Um, it's a really great kind of versatile plant, um, and it will get a nice, cute little, uh, you know, blue flower uh, in the season as well, too. But it is a great filler element nice border, uh, um, you know, garden space item. And I also like using it as fillers in combinations as well, too. So the texture is just really quite lovely also. Yeah, that is. That's wonderful. Okay, now back to you, Laura. And I think we have two Green Thumb Award winners to talk about. Yeah, so this one is um, another fairly new introduction from us called Sedum Back in Black. Um, so this one is also part of the Proven Winners uh, line of perennials. Um, this is a plant that we took over 10 years of selections to try to come up with a nice dark foliage sedum um, that is great in the landscape, that doesn't lodge open. So some of the older genetics of sedum, um, if any of you have had them in your garden, sometimes as the, as the season progresses and the plants get taller and then the, the weather doesn't um, cooperate or it gets windy or stormy, those plants will kind of lodge and flop open in the middle. Um, and so we've worked really hard to select varieties that don't do that. Um, and this particular one back in black, you can see how nice and dark the foliage gets. So when this plant first comes up in the spring, um, it's not going to be this dark. I actually have some right outside my front door. And when you see it first thing in the spring, it looks um, kind of more like a green with some purple tinging to it. Um, but a lot of the dark foliage plants that you see really require some direct UV sunlight to pick up those dark tones in the foliage and express um, the chemicals in the plant that, that create this dark tone. Um, and so once that plant starts to grow and, and receives more of the sunlight, it will deepen and darken in tone. Um, and then this particular one back in black uh, develops a nice kind of deep, dark garnet colored flower um, late summer and into the fall. And then is also um, just nice fall and winter interest if you leave that plant standing. Great, thank you. Now, Stilby? Yeah, so a Stilby, Dark Side of the Moon, this is one of my favorite new introductions. Um, so um, there are not very many dark foliage a Stilby on the market. The only other one that I know of is one called Chocolate Shogun that has a white flower. Uh, but now we have this variety called Dark Side of the Moon that has the nice purple flower. Um, so in my opinion, it's um, a more vigorous plant than Chocolate Shogun. And it just it gives a little bit different look with that purple versus the white. Um, this is another plant that in the northern areas, so where I am here in Michigan and other northern parts of the country, um, this plant does great in full sun. Um, in my opinion, it actually does a little bit better in full sun in the north and the south more Southern areas, you would want to have this plant um, in a little bit more shade. Um, but actually I've been hearing from some of our Southern customers and some of the Southern um, like social media influencers who trial our plants in the South, that this one does very, very well for an astilbe in the South. So some of the astilbe do not function so well or perform so well in the South. And this one does do quite well. So if any of you listening here 
um, are in the South, um, this would be a good astilbe to try. Um, and when this plant is first coming up in the spring, um, the foliage is a little bit more of a reddish tinge to it. And again, as uh, the season progresses and the, the leaves expand and take on that sunlight, then they take on those nice dark tones. And I'm sorry, did you say what zone it is? Um, this is hardy from about zone four to nine. Great, thank you. And Jessica, did you have something? Well, I was just glad as a gardener in Georgia, I'm glad that Laura mentioned some astilbes don't work because I have had that experience. You plant them and you have so much like, you know, excitement for them and promise, and then um, they don't perform. So I'm excited to also try this one because, uh, yes, yeah, it sounds like a winner. Absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Who did this one belong to? Belong to? So we carry this one in our um, in our catalog, so I can talk about it. Um, it's not one that that our breeding department um, develops. So at Walters, we we do have our own breeding team that creates new genetics, but we also carry a lot of other perennials that are plants that are in demand that you know have been on the market for a while, or we also carry other breeders' genetics. So I don't know the kind of genetic background or story of this plant. But Alcea, uh, Black Knight, this is, um, a lot of people know these as hollyhocks. So this is a traditional hollyhock. Um, so this is kind of a more heirloom type plant that um, a lot of people would have seen maybe in their grandmother's gardens. Uh, but this one, of course, is a little bit more distinctive because it does have the, these really deep, dark, purpley black flowers. Um, so this is a plant that um, is tends to be what you would call like a biennial or a shorter lived perennial. So this is not something that you would plant in your garden and expect to live for, you know, a long time, like some of the, some of the plants, um, even the, the Baptisia is one that's a super long lived plant. I mean, that'll outlive gardeners. Like it, if you plant that Baptisia in your yard, it'll probably be there when you, you know, move on. Um, but uh, the Alcea is one where you would plant it and expect to replant every few years. Um, and the, the flower stems do get quite tall on these. So it's a nice plant to use in full sun settings. Um, a lot of people like to use them kind of up against the backdrop of a fence or near the back of the border because uh, they do get quite tall. Thank you. Euphorbia. Yeah, so Euphorbia ruby glow is another one of our uh, perennials from our lineup. Uh, and I also really like this one because again, it's a nice kind of like low uh, shrub. Uh, it's going to get to be only about like three to four feet tall and wide max within the season. Um, again, it's another one of those uh, perennial shrubs that, you know, will make kind of a shrub habit, but again, it'll die back to the ground uh, come here in the winter time and it's hardy through zone five. Um, so similar to some of the other, you know, black colored uh, perennials we've seen so far, again, this variety is going to start out as a darker toned green in the springtime, and then we'll start as we, you know, progress through the summer and into the fall season, uh, change into the red foliage here in the summer, and then it'll fade into this dark, almost black, uh, like Merlot colored foliage uh, here in the late fall. It's really quite lovely. Um, so again, Euphorbia Ruby Glow is a great one to add. Thank you. And now we have an ornamental grass, it looks like. And who put that one in? Sorry, I was talking and didn't realize I was muted. Okay. Um, that is one that we carry um, in our ornamental grass program. This is called Andropogon Blackhawks. Uh, this is actually an example of one that we picked up from a, another breeding uh, company. So this one was actually developed by Intrinsic Perennials, um, Brent Horvath. And he does a lot of work with, um, not all, but a lot of his plants are native perennials. So this is one, Andrew Pogon is a native grass to the United States. Um, and as you can see, it gets some nice dark coloration, lots of great interest um, on towards fall as well, as that's when you start to get the taller um, the taller flower spikes appear kind of later in the summer and on towards fall. And this is a plant that some people refer to as turkey foot, because if you look up close at the flowers, unfortunately, we don't have a close up shot um, in this presentation, but the flowers are kind of like a, a three way um, split to them. And so they kind of look like turkey toes. Um, so just a nice ornamental grass with that really dark uh, kind of reddish black foliage. 
Thank you. Sorry, was um, this is uh, this is probably another one I should talk about. This is another one that we've had in our catalog. Um, again, this is um, not developed by Walters Gardens, but it's something that we carry. So Simisifuga, um, this is a um, wonderful kind of shade or woodland garden perennial. Um, so a lot of people will use this intermingled with hostas um, or other shady type plants. Um, the Simisifuga is um, a native as well, a native cultivar. Um, and it will develop kind of a um, bottle brush type white flower, um, but really the, the main uh, focus of this plant is its beautiful dark foliage. Excellent, thank you. And, oh my gosh, this one's so cool. Yes, so this is an example of where I was talking about earlier that we do a little bit of work with plants that aren't necessarily hardy um, in all zones. Um, but are perennial somewhere. So this is actually a kind of man-made created genus of plants uh, called mangave. So these were developed by crossbreeding agave um, with another closely related genus of plants that's found mostly in the Southern United States and parts of Central America called manfreda. And the resulting cross is a mangave. And what you get from the mangave are um, a lot of the kind of speckles and darker colors and unique colorations from the Manfreda genus. Um, you get a lot of the textural elements um, from the agave genus. Uh, they're faster growing than agaves are because of the Manfreda. Um, and they also tend to be less spiny, especially the varieties that have a little bit more of the background of the Manfreda. So some agave have very sharp spines um, and the mangave tend to be much softer and easier to handle. Um, so they're, I think, a lot more friendly plants to have um, in your garden or in containers on your patio. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, brushing up against sharp spiny plants. Um, and these are just three that I picked that I thought went really well with the goth theme. So we do have some with a much darker foliage. Again, this is something that needs the UV light. Um, but when they have that UV light, they develop these nice dark colorations. So the Black Magic is one of the darkest ones that we have, um, which is kind of in that top corner. Uh, directly beneath it is um, another one called Night Owl that um, isn't quite as dark, but does have kind of a silvery tone with the darker speckles on it. Um, and then the one on the side there by itself is called Praying Hands. Not quite as dark, but that... Um, just the, the habit and the architecture of the plant just makes me think it fits well with the goth theme. Um, it it kind of looks like a big artichoke. And that one does have a little bit more of a spine to the tip of the foliage, but because of the way that the foliage is oriented up like this, um, it's still a much safer plant than some of the agave that have their leaves spread out and then still have that spiny tip on them. Um, so in terms of using these plants, most of the mangave... Um, are hardy to zone eight. So it's definitely not going to be winter hardy in more northern zones. Um, but what you can do is either bring it inside um, to use as a house plant during the winter. Um, they survive very well in a house in the winter. I have some in my house. Um, they don't require much water um, for overwintering in a house. Um, when they're outside in the garden, they're actually a little bit misleading. A lot of people just assume that they're going to be a very dry, deserty plant. Uh, but they actually can take moisture just like a hosta does. Um, so they're a plant that can um, tolerate a dry down, but will grow faster and be perfectly happy with more moisture. Um, the other thing you can do if you don't want a bunch of mangave in your house is throw them in a the garage. Uh, where I live in Michigan, I'm zone six. Uh, we get pretty cold in the winter um, and I throw mine in my garage for the winter and then just bring them back out in the spring and they're happy campers. So they're kind of fun to use um, in containers or um, sometimes I'll just take pots and kind of place them around my garden where other perennials or plants might grow up around and hide the pot and it just kind of looks like it's planted. Um, or if you want to, you can also plant it and then either just let them die for the winter or dig them up. If you're in the north um, in the south, you can be even more flexible with them. Sounds like many uses. So yes. now let's talk about what's showing up behind your screen there. Yes. So hellebores. Um, hellebores are a plant that is really um, a super, super early 
kind of season extender for your garden. So at a time when there's not really much else going on in the garden in terms of flowers, um, hellebores are going to show um, their true colors. And I selected some of the ones that are dark for this. Um, so there are two different types of hellebores. Um, all of the ones pictured on this screen and all of the ones that would fit in with the goth gardening theme that have the darker tones um, are orientalis types. And they're going to bloom um, quite early, but not as early as the traditional Lenten rose that people might think of with hellebores. That's actually a different species that blooms even earlier. Uh, but in Michigan, these will bloom in like February or March. Um, so still, there's not much else, not much else blooming um, when these come up. Um, and the foliage on these is evergreen, so they do have season-long interest in terms of the foliage. Um, and then um, the flowers have been kind of developed for the plant evolutionarily to kind of nod or hang downwards. So some of them will face outwards, more of them nod downwards, and that is to prevent water collecting um, inside that cup of flower and interfering with pollination. Um, and so a fun thing that a lot of people will do in their gardens um, is put a mirror underneath the plant, especially if it's in a container. And that way you can see the underneath side of the hellebore flower without having to, you know, stop and bend and, and turn over the flower by hand. Sounds like a mirror would be a great thing to add to a goth garden. Yes. And uh, the hellebores are um, more of a shade plant um, and they're actually uh, a little bit more of a dry shade plant. So um, compared to hostas, they can tolerate more dry shade and they have a kind of a tough leathery leaf that the deer and rabbits don't like to eat. That's good news. Um, and then colocasia, I feel like I'm taking up too much time. I'm going to try and go really quick. So this is a tropical. Um, this is something that we carry that um, just lends kind of that Florida tropical look. Um, definitely not going to be hardy in the north, uh, but fantastic container element. They get really super large foliage. So these are also known as elephant ears um, and need that sunshine to develop that color. Those are beautiful. Okay. Okay, I think this is the last one I have. I hope so. I feel bad. I'm taking up so much time. Um, so this is a new category of plant that we've been um, starting to, to work with in terms of our breeding called Saracenia. And this is a native pitcher plant. Um, so they, these are actually carnivorous plants, which I thought just fit perfectly with this. So you can see the pitchers. Um, those actually lure and trap insects. And that's how the plant gets its nutrition. Um, and then they do kind of have the red tones that I thought the color scheme also fits well um, with this theme. And these are going to be hardy to zone five. Um, and they do like um, kind of boggy conditions. Um, if there's time at the end, I can go more into that. So I'll I'll let somebody else to take, take a turn now. No problem. You're our perennial expert here. So that, <laughs> that's awesome. And now you can rest your voice and listen, listen to our other panelists. But thank you so much. Those are some very interesting perennials. It's, it's amazing what you guys are coming out with. Um, so yeah, we're going to now move on to annuals. Um, I think the first couple I'll pop in on here. This is a begonia. This is from Monrovia. And it has that dark leaf foliage with the spots. It's called Ninetta. And actually this begonia will work well outdoors or indoors as a houseplant. So it's a dual purpose. And then we have this Celosia. It is the year of the Celosia. And we just had a webinar about two weeks ago on this. And we loved this Celosia type that has the dark foliage and then that, shall I call it blood red uh, coxcomb on top of it. So that's Dracula Celosia. And let's see here. Uh, Viola Sorbet, that is, that's not one of our panelists, is it? Is it? Okay, okay. Either way, so, it's a, so it's not one of ours, but yes, so um, violas are great for uh, small um, vignettes or mixed combo pots. And obviously using um, color when it's cold because uh, violas are very tough. So in the South, we can actually plant these in the fall and they'll go all the way through spring for color. Um, these are also an edible if you're growing them for culinary use, meaning um, you know not using pesticides or other methods that wouldn't make them edible. So so these um, have a nice, yeah, dual use uh, purpose to them. Excellent. And then I believe you have, um, well, it's here. This one's, this That's one's also yours. Can -Am, yeah. Yeah. So this one's yours. 
<laughs> yeah, so um, ornamental peppers are um, a class. So we saw um, black pearl earlier, which has black fruits. This one is actually a color changing one. So this is onyx red. It's an AAS winner. It's behind me in my uh, my background uh, round picture. And so the fruits start out black and then they will transition to red over the season. So this one, though, is as opposed to like black pearl, which is super tall and leggy. This one stays nice and compact. Um, so lots of branching. So it's going to look full. And um, yeah, this one works great combo pot and also for landscape use. I do get the question all the time. Can you eat it? Kind of like viola. Yeah, you can, but this is bred for ornamental use. And so there are much better culinary peppers that we would recommend you grow for eating versus this, which will be for ornamental use. Right. And most ornamental peppers are on either end of the scale, right? They're either like so bland that why would you bother? Or they uh -huh. are so hot that you don't even want to attempt it. Yes. And then with the onyx red, which was so popular, um, we actually just this year are launching onyx orange. And so this we had um, someone earlier talk about autumn or Halloween themed. You can imagine this one, plop it in a pumpkin for um, a, a theme that would look super cute. And these fruits actually start out purple and will transition uh, to like a bit of a yellowish and then orange in the end. But it still has that nice purple um, horizontal foliage, which will show off the fruits as they change colors. Awesome. Yes, uh, the Canna series Canova. Um, it's and what's great is all of these are from seed, and so um, you know if you're a home gardener who likes to do your own transplants, these are great options. Even the the capsicums, the the peppers are from seed. This Canna is from seed, and it's bronze scarlet. So this fits, yeah, two of those color um, themes that we talked about with goth gardening. Not only does it have that bronze foliage, but it also has a blood red, <laughs> uh, scarlet colored um, flower. And this one is, yeah, Cannas are known for being uh, heat lovers. So you want to, yeah, wait for summertime before you um, get this going because it wants the heat. And it also tolerates wet feet or even waterscapes. So this could be on an edge of a pond, or if you have a little fountain, this can work um, and, and will enjoy wet feet as well. And Petunia Trilogy. So what's very cool about the silver blotch is that this little blotch in the center of that flower contrasts so well with a black foliage item. And this, these are some of the combo pots that we've been um, exploring and playing with this year, because yeah, you need those tall, maybe like the scarlet bronze um, canna, and then you want something that will fill or spill. Um, so this uh, Trilogy Silver Blotch fits that purpose. Trilogy is known for being super branching, covered with flowers. And yeah, this color theme uh, mixes very well with all the dark foliage. Great, thank you. Then we have another petunia, I believe. Stephanie, this is yours. Yeah, it is our sweet tunia series uh, from Duman. And uh, sweet tunias are known for uh, having that little bit more of a vigorous habit, uh, great upright, some nice mounding upright uh, sort of habit. Some that makes them perfect for using in hanging baskets or in mixed combinations as well. Uh, and one of our, our favorites is black satin, the all very dark black. Um, and it it's, has almost like a velvety texture to the petals. You almost kind of want to touch it because it looks so uh, like lush and uh, velvety. Uh, it's, we use it in a, a number of our combinations is that filler element. Uh, and it pairs really nicely with uh, both white foliage as well as silver and some others. We'll see this later on in the presentation too. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of go quick because we'll send this out later, but I want you to talk about the callas here. Sure. Uh, so, um, and, and we can actually go really quickly back one slide. Uh, I threw that slide in there about bulbs and cut flowers, just to kind of throw it out there that um, I have a friend who runs the little flower school in Brooklyn, uh, and she focuses on um, making really lush and beautiful, you know, foliage and, and cut flower designs, uh, really using the Dutch master painters as her kind of inspiration. So that's another kind of thought process that, you know, you can go with you can even bring, you know, goth gardening uh, indoors as well, too. So 
Um, we can talk about the callus uh, for sure. So we have um, a line of callus from Doom and Orange as well. Uh, and we're dabbling more into or trying to look for uh, both uh, darker foliage callus and also dark um, you know, flowering callus as well too. And two of our new ones that are out for both 2023 and coming out uh, next spring in 2024 is the Dallas as well as the Memories. So uh, definitely put those on your plant wish lists uh, as you're out uh, doing your plant hunting at garden centers. Love those. I had callas in my wedding. I didn't have black callas. I had white callas in my wedding, but I'm a little bit partial to them. Um, we are going to send out this list, so I'll go real quick through the edibles. But I thought um, maybe you guys would want to talk a little bit about some of these combinations. Sure. So uh, the Garden Party is a line of combinations from Doom and Orange where we're incorporating a number of different mixes uh, or different types of annuals um, within each of the different combinations. So it's kind of going beyond the traditional Petunia Verbena Calabrocoa sort of mix. And Starry Night is uh, one of ours that we've created that uses the black, black satin uh, sweet tunia petunia and is pairing it with a number of different elements. Here we paired it with um, a black uh, leafed uh, epimia or sweet potato vine, along with um, the artemisia. And then also you can see kind of underneath and in, in, tucked in between the petunia and the sweet potato vine, there is a euphorbia, a diamond frost um, or a euphorbia, a, a white foliage one, uh, which really kind of helps pick up all of those silvery, velvety, iridescent sort of tones that are not only within the white and the silvery foliage, but kind of play off of the black as well too. So um, a really great mix and just kind of fun inspiration for folks as well too. Yes, exactly. Okay, and then Jessica, there's this one that you presented at um, CAST just recently, which is the petunia that you just mentioned. Yes, so like I was talking about with that um, center blotch and how well you can see in the background, it works with um, our onyx uh, red um, ca capsicum and then for the centerpiece is the bronze uh, scarlet canna so that one yeah is a winner excellent okay and then um the last thing that we oh that was, was a video um i was going to conclude and then allow each one of our panelists to kind of make a closing comment is it was interesting i love pinterest i'm on it all the time it's it's huge for um national garden bureau and so when i was in there about goth they even have goth aesthetic paint colors so i mean some of these are beautiful and if you're looking like at this blackberry or rouge color i mean those definitely are available in flowers and so mixing those up and and some grays would would definitely lend a color scheme to a goth garden and then look at this um we had talked earlier about some different terminology dark academia aka sherlock holmes or harry potter um, again, go on to Pinterest, do a Google search, and you're going to get all kinds of ideas. These are internal, you know, these are interior um, designs, but look at that, they have some plants in there too. And then what was my last one? Oh, we talked about uh, moon gardens. So it was interesting that this was one of the Pinterest pins that we saw also. So I think there are tons of ideas on how to incorporate this theme both indoors and out. So each one of you, would you like to make a closing comment about um, some additional ideas for goth gardening? Well, if I had to say anything, we just want to use this theme as a jumping off point, showing you uh, that you can do all sorts of things in your garden that you find interesting. And so that would be my encouragement is just to try don't be worried um, about what other people think. Just do what you want to do in your garden because it is your garden. And we want to encourage you to get out there because we know that gardening is therapeutic. So however you're, you know, making your combinations or color choices, I would say just make sure you're getting out there and doing it. Great advice. Stephanie or Laura? Sure. Yeah, I, I agree completely with Jessica. Um, I would also, you know, just add to that uh, anywhere where if you are 
out and about and you find a uni unique or different you know, piece, whether it be even a broken fountain or a piece of garden furniture, uh, a mirror that you could hang into a tree somewhere. Um, it, that's the kind of, I think the fun thing about goth gardening or even just gardening in general is, uh, you know, you can make it your own and uh, experiment. And some of the nice things too about annuals is if you didn't like it this year, you don't have to do it next year. Don't worry about it. Um, and try it again uh, come next spring. So that's that's awesome advice as well. Okay, so Laura, we let you rest for a little bit, but we'd love for you to come back and give us your closing thoughts. Yeah, I'd just like to echo with what both Jessica and Stephanie have said. Um, just this is something to try and experiment with. And one of the great things about gardening is that it's never done. So um, even if you put something in and you don't like it or you do like it, but you just want to make more beds that are that same type of theme or style, um, it's just a good excuse to get out there every year and try new things and, and switch things up a little bit. Very good. So with that, thank you, ladies. This has been very interesting. Love all the plants that you guys are bringing to market. I, I hope everybody can go out and find them.